Well, yes, it is, it is a successful story in that way, but um, it's also an ongoing story. It's been, it's been an, a rolling news story. Um, and every time I come to speak to anyone about this, there's, there's a whole lot of new things that have happened. Um, and as Martin pointed out, um, this, this is the former Prime Minister of, of Malaysia and his extremely powerful, frightening and, and rapacious wife. Um, they're actually there uh, coming out of a court situation. They're both facing multiple charges and um, both of them are in the middle of an extended trials over in Kuala Lumpur now that his government has been overthrown. Um, and indeed, um, just yesterday, Friday, that the son, their son, uh, was at last himself charged, and that's him coming out of court again in KL um, with uh, money laundering himself. And this, of course, is none other than Riza Aziz, um, the Hollywood producer behind that, um, cap, uh, you know, that slapdash caper about spending stolen money, Wolf of Wall Street. The other big big ongoing rolling story relating to um, this scandal and, and what really brings it home to us as a massive global scandal, um, which I've obviously been covering with Glee, is, is uh, what's happening uh, to Goldman Sachs as a result of their role in this and, and its exposure. Exposure. There are numerous uh, lawsuits now out against uh, Goldman Sachs. Their share, shares have plummeted in the last year, um, and indeed shareholders are, are currently suing uh, them for having um, for the, the the bank for having uh, brought 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 themselves into disrepute and got into this scandal. Um, the DOJ, in fact, most recently ex, um, uh, stated that they would be willing to enter into a plea bargain with the bank on the basis that the bank ex, um, accepted guilt over 1MDB, um, which of course the bank is, is desperate to avoid um, given the impact that would have on its credibility and standing. So this is a struggle now um, that's really gone to the heart of global capitalism. Um, and it started, it started of course in this rainforest campaign that, that Martin was, was um, alluding to. Um, Another development, actually, again, just last week, um, that's Tim Leisner, the former Southeast Asia boss of uh, Goldman Sachs, um, with his model wife, for those who know about Kimora Lee Simmons, who's apparently very well known in sort of social set circles. Um, he is now, um, he was due to be sentenced, um, and it was going to be a jail sentence, on Thursday. Um, and we were all interested to see that delayed on Thursday, um, apparently he's not going to be sentenced now until December, and that's set minds ticking around the world as to uh, what deals he may be still doing with the DOJ, for example, um, with regard to um, their ongoing case against Goldman. Um, so you can see that this was a massive scandal, and of course what, it's, what it turned into was um, my expose, my exploration into the theft and then the spending of at least $4.5 billion uh, from a Malaysian development fund by agents of the Prime Minister. And, and the key character that I've not yet spoken about now, you can see in many of those pictures, um, the chubby Joe Lowe there in the Panama hat, there um, blowing bottles and bottles of Cristal Champagne with um, uh, Paris Hilton there at the, um, um, at the launch of Wolf of Wall Street with, with Riza Aziz and so forth. Um, so, so for me, it was, as a journalist, rather fun to, um, to sort of keep people in trance, particularly once Malaysians got hooked on this story, um, of just how the money was spent, a, a quarter of a billion dollars on that super yacht, um, numerous um, Hollywood mansions, um, some of which I broke into to check. Um, that, that movie, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, um, Joe's big pal in, uh, in Hollywood was uh, Leo DiCaprio, who, who starred in that movie. And as, as Martin um, so eloquently put it, you know, um, what soon became uh, obvious to, to me was uh, that the antics of the expenditure and the criminality of the people who made that film, you know, just dwarfed uh, the, the antics of the movie itself. Um, just some of the attributes that I was able, the, the, these were some of the cars um, that belonged to, to one of the conspirators in, in this story. Um, he had 50 actually, a fleet of 50 um, uh, bespoke sports cars costing millions of dollars each. 
Um, and, and there was the man at the center of it, um, Joe Lowe. And I use that photograph um, for a reason, obviously. Um, Joe Lowe, who was nothing more than a 20-something thief, um, used that money to gain enormous respectability, credibility, and there he is standing uh, you know, at the, at the uh, front of the UN building, where he became a major funder of the UN Foundation. Um, in fact, at, at the time that photograph was, um, was released, he was describing himself as a third generation billionaire, whereas I knew that you know, just a few years before when he was trying to explain away some of the antics that were appearing in the newspapers about him spending vast sums, record sums of money in New York nightclubs, um, he was telling journalists then that actually you know, he was just doing it and organizing stuff for his rich friends, and he called himself a kind of concierge to rich Middle Eastern friends and business associates of his. But yes, he, just uh, two years later, here he was, this global philanthropist for the UN. And, and as journalists, you might be interested to know, it really knocked me. Um, jo Jolo was um, actually, the money he was giving to the UN was to fund um, a global media um, uh, outfit for the UN called New Media, I think, World Media. And, and this was supposed to bring investigative journalism um, you know, to, to all corners of the globe. Um, um, and uh, one of the first stories that these highly paid um, UN investigative journalists came up with was a great story about how Joe Lowe had reformed himself and turned himself from a party boy into a philanthropist. Um, and meanwhile, of course, um, you know, attacking, attacking myself, um, who was for nothing um, chasing this story. Um, so, it, so it went on. Um, uh, this, the, these are some of the characters who got caught up in the Jolo story. It's amazing, you know, the friends that money can buy. Um, Miranda was famously one of Joe's um, heartthrobs, actually. He took her on a, on a spin, his, his inaugural spin of that yacht that you saw around the Caribbean um, for its uh, first uh, uh, trip out. Um, it was a Valentine's uh, occasion, and he, he bought her $8 million do worth of diamonds, bespoke matching diamonds. Um, as a gift on that occasion. Um, can't think what this string of beautiful women uh, from Hollywood saw in Joe Lowe, um, but she, uh, uh, she finally found a, um, a husband in uh, the uh, founder of Snapchat, I believe. Um, <clears throat> so getting back to where all this story came out from, um, which was uh, Malaysia, uh, you know, a place that you know, most people in, in Hollywood have hardly heard of. Um, and uh, you know, they just assumed it was another sort of kind of one of those Middle Eastern places, lots of oil, where they could finance movies out of. You know? um, Malaysia had been under the rule of um, one party uh, since independence, so it was into its sixth decade. Um, and by the time that party had um, been in power for six decades, you can, you can uh, imagine just how, what a grip they had got on, on power. Um, it had become centralized. Um, many of the institutions that had been originally within the constitution had been eroded so that um, Najib Razak, inheriting the job effectively from his father and um, his extremely um, domineering wife, um, really controlled the country um, without um, any restraints whatsoever. He was the prime minister, he was the finance minister, he was the president of the ruling party, and he was also in charge of this fund that he set up, supposedly for development, called 1MDB. He, he controlled actually over half the economy of Malaysia because um, the economy is very much um, you know, in the hands of, of the government. Um, so he was regarded really as someone that one couldn't uh, hope to, to topple or, or let alone criticize. Um, they had very, very um, strong rules um, to control the media, as you can well imagine. You couldn't print anything without a license, and, and they had some very, very um, intimidating and nasty rules, uh, you know, um, punishments that they could uh, impose on journalists who were regarded as having, for example, um, committed an act of sedition by criticizing the government. Um, but um, as, as you know, this, this couple were to be toppled, and uh, the story that I um, broke um, played a role in that. Um, um, and they, they had uh, appropriated huge sums of money from the state. And indeed, after the election, um, as the police moved into some of the strong houses that they had hidden their, their loot in, as they realized that they may actually lose power, um, they, they um, 
extracted enormous amounts of um, possessions and wealth. That, those are some of the 274 still boxed Hermes handbags, um, Birkin handbags that, um, that Rosamond was particularly partial to. Um, they're worth, of course, tens and even hundreds of thousands of pounds each. There was a quarter of a billion dollars worth of loose change in different currencies knocking around the house. Um, and of course, after that election, um, the opposition leader who had been jailed um, in order to um, basically uh, stymie the opposition in the run up to the election um, was, was released. Um, so this, this was a big, big story for uh, Malaysia. Um, but it started, it started with some very poor and vulnerable people um, before it really reached through Malaysia and into, you know, a globe became a global story that can tell all of us a great deal about how our entire global financial systems, um, our, all our systems work, and why we should be looking at these sorts of trails. Um, I was born in part of Malaysia. Um, I, for all my adult uh, professional life, I'd been working as a, as a, a television reporter, so that was my skill. Um, but um, I'd grown up. Um, in Sarawak, East Malaysia, where the Borneo jungle was basically being ravaged, grabbed, um, and turned into cash uh, by um, a small number of people who had got control of the government. Um, and uh, once, once they'd taken out trillions of dollars worth of timber, all the money was going into, um, into the pockets of a very few politically connected people um, and their... Um, their associates um, in, the, in the world of, of, of logging, uh, they would then roll out um, massive palm oil plantations as a quick fix cash crop. And I think most people in this room will have, will have now you know, become aware of the palm oil debate. Um, at the time I started looking at what this was doing to the native communities of Borneo, for whom I felt distraught, and indeed um, to the environment of Borneo, which is unique. It's the most biodiverse place on the planet, the oldest uh, tropical jungle on the planet. Um, you know, absolutely the, you know, the center of, of all that we, we can learn about life on Earth, um, a, a repository of <coughs> DNA, and, and definitely a vital resource for the future as, as our um, species diversity decreases. As I was covering those issues, not many people knew about the palm oil debate, but it's now taken center stage, as has all the other um, results that come that affect us all of deforestation, um, you know, um, in terms of climate change, um, species extinction and all the rest. Um, so this was an, a subject that was close to my heart because of my upbringing um, and also something I felt I, I had an understanding of that at that time was not being reported on. It was a massive, massive amount of money that was being cashed in, um, a global a, a resource grab um, unrestrained by the central government in Malaysia because um, you know, it was itself an extremely uh, corrupt and centralized government that was allowing the governors of Sarawak and next door Sabah really to do what they liked in return for letting the federal government have the oil money that was also available um, from these two East Malaysian states of Borneo. So there in the center, you can see um, the elderly Thai Mahmood with his considerably younger wife. Um, and um, next to him, a slightly smaller villain in terms of financial um, um, uh, um, you know, wealth, um, Musa Aman. These were the two chief ministers of the states of Sarawak. And what I decided, um, having looked into all that was going on, into the repression of the local media, talked to local journalists who, who explained how they just couldn't dare cover um, the corruption that was going on in these, in these two states, particularly in, in Sarawak. And having um, you know, decided I was never going to get the global media to bother to you know, drop by this remote area um, and, and do anything substantial on this massive, massive story that was so important to all of us in so many ways, um, I decided I, I had discovered a chink, um, which was uh, the internet uh, that was being rolled out um, at that time in Malaysia, which was an, an, a relatively advanced developing economy. Um, and so I had started a blog, and I thought, well, at least a few people will read my blog. I'm safe here in the UK. I can, I can try and put my investigative skills to, to, to work and see if anybody reads it, picks up on it. Um, but I also became slightly more ambitious because that blog um, was immediately pounced on by, by people in Malaysia who, who I, I suddenly realized I was getting thousands of hits. And so I thought, well, 
well, we need to get this message out to those very remote people in the jungle. And I remembered when I was a small girl how we used to listen, uh, living in these places, uh, to the crackly, whirling sounds of the BBC World Service. And in fact, my very first job was in the BBC World Service. I did a little bit of investigation and found that shortwave still exists. And because it's so outmoded, you can actually get shortwave radio relatively cheaply. Um, and I started a shortwave radio station that again became a news, it became a news story in itself in Malaysia. And, and you know, that was part of the battle. The other part of the battle was getting the stories. And I started doing what you as investigative journalists will all do, uh, look for your sources, because you know, that's, really, that's really where the stories come from. Forget the data, look for sources. And I found a source that started to give me an insight over in the United States, um, a man who had worked for some of the chief minister's companies, because of what they were doing, of course, was plowing all their money into foreign property. Um, the forests were being logged, um, but no one was paying any money back into Sarawak. Um, all these guys, this timber mafia, were, were getting the money out. And these were just some of Taib's uh, major building interests, uh, major property interests <laughs> in the United States, which even, which even included the northwestern headquarters of the FBI. And by this stage, I was beginning to understand a system that was at work. If I guess we all have an inkling of it. But it was plain and obvious to me that um, you know, the, Borneo, the Borneo timber companies, there are six main ones, and they're all linked to Taib Mahmood, the, uh, you know, the, the, the godfather, really, of the global timber mafia, is what I call him. Um, they were the biggest uh, customer of um, Caterpillar Trucks, Peoria. Um, and, and what happened actually was that Caterpillar Trucks advanced their vehicles to the logging companies of Sarawak, um, having worked out just how much that timber would be worth, um, and they collected once the timber had been sold, um, and um, you know, they got their money back on their, on their trucks. And there were literally armies of these vehicles tearing down the jungle. And, and I went out there with my film camera um, before I was, I was banished entirely from the, from the island. Um, and I filmed how they were working 24-7, 24-7 with headlights just grabbing, grabbing, grabbing at the jungle. Um, but, but none of this could have happened you know, without that complicity, the big companies that were prepared to invest, to lend, but also, of course, more importantly, that global financial system that was enabling the money to be brought out uh, via offshore companies into the banking system, um, you know, with the assistance of offshore incorporators, lawyers, tax, tax experts, um, accountants, um, Businessmen who were helping, you know, the reinvestment of that money in, in our country, in the United States, Australia, and across the world. Um, all this money was plowing in to our um, advanced economies, um, and it was leaving those tribespeople who I photographed there uh, with precisely nothing. In fact, with less than nothing, because before they had been able to live off their jungle. Now their landscape was polluted, destroyed, um, eroding, and um, many, many of them were actually simply starving. Um, they were being starved out of the jungle. Their young folk were having to go and live on the rubbish dumps, you know, on the edges of the coastal logging towns. Um, so, so, so this was a mechanism, and, and I was very certain that um, it didn't, um, it didn't uh, sort of, you know, th this was just one example of what I could see was really happening all over the world. But um, I decided what I could do would be to focus on this one example. And for example, you know, that was just one of the banks that was involved that I was able to expose. UBS is uh, currently uh, facing prosecution, um, it's a rare thing in Switzerland, um, because I had got hold of, um, again through another source, um, the bank statements of, of Musa Aman, that other um, uh, chief minister who I featured earlier, um, and, and I could show exactly how um, they had enabled and facilitated tens of millions of dollars of timber kickbacks through a whole sh series of offshore shell companies into his Zurich bank account. Um, and they are now finally, after about six years of wrangling with the Swiss prosecutors, well, they're still wrangling, but they are facing prosecution um, over that money laundering and Musa Arman's timber kickbacks. Um, so I was, you know, I was wrestling with all these issues um, at, at the time that Martin came to find out a little bit more about my radio station down in Covent Garden about sort of eight years ago now. <laughs> 
And what I realized was that I was, um, I was exposing all of these guys, and no one was doing a thing about it, obviously. Um, and I'd had a numerous, numerous cracking stories. You know, I did expose the banks. I'd expose these two guys. I'd shown all their, you know, I'd shown how it all worked. Um, I, I had become, you know, an absolute target of. Um, I'd made myself very well known in Sri Lanka, put it that way. And and we'd certainly reversed, um, you know, his uh, the grip at the, on the local elections. Um, I'd seen the impact of what um, I was exposing in the fact that in the 2011 elections, all the urban seats evaporated from the grasp of the ruling uh, party in Sarawak. And that told me something. You tell people. You tell people what's happening. You prove what their suspicions are. And that's um, they will move. They will move. And tied by that, so he stood up in parliament after that election. And he targeted me and called me a neo-colonialist, uh, uh, poisoning the minds of the people and out to grab the oil wealth of, of the country. So, so I knew I was doing my job as a journalist, um, having annoyed him so much. Um, but I realized I was going to get nowhere because um, these guys were being protected at the top. And it had become quite clear now um, that, that you know, the federal government of Malaysia was equally um, caught up in, in this you know, suffocating corruption that had just got worse and worse and worse, um, thanks to years and years and years of inherited and established excessive power. Um, and I had heard about this uh, development fund that everyone was calling behind you know, behind their hands, uh, Najib Razak's um, slush fund. And indeed, he'd set this up after coming into power. Um, and um, the first elections he'd had to face um, were very difficult elections because he had a path. You know, the internet had had the effect. It was giving, it was giving the opposition party a way of getting around the established, very constrained media um, to reach out to the people. And they did have this charismatic opposition leader that he was, you know, he set about very rapidly, um, you know, pinning a, a sodomy charge on and banging into jail before the, before, um, the, the next election came up. But in 2013, he was facing this guy uh, who, who was getting a lot of traction. Um, and there was still this element of democracy in Malaysia. So, so although, you know, there was all the gerrymandering you can imagine, um, and indeed vote buying, um, there was still that potential to lose an election. Um, and, and having set up this development fund, which borrowed billions, um, we'd, we saw an election awash with cash. Um, voters were being, uh, and, I, and I was able to cap get the visual um, examples of that, were being literally handed money as they came out of the booth and you know, showed that they had voted for BN. Um, there was not much I could do about it um, until, um, you know, uh, I started to dig at some of the blatant stuff that you could see. Now, I, I'd picked up, as and I've talked about Joe Lowe, I'd picked up on his lavish spending. Joe Lowe was known to be Najib Razak's youthful advisor on that development fund. Uh, nobody knew where those, those billions that he'd borrowed were going. There was not much evidence of development. They were failing on bringing in their accounts. Opposition uh, politicians had started to raise this issue by, by the end of 2013, which is when I got stuck into the story. Um, and everyone knew that this terribly uh, flush guy um, was involved. Um, but what triggered me on the story was this movie. Because um, when it was released in January 2014, I got a little tip off which was that the producer behind the movie was Najib's stepson, Reza Aziz, the guy who got charged yesterday. Um, and that seemed interesting to me, because like Joe Lowe, he was very young. Um, I looked him up. He'd been to the LSE. He'd left there. He'd had a junior banking job for two years. He'd kind of lost that um, during the crash. And then he suddenly popped up in Hollywood with $100 million to spend on a movie. So that attracted my attention. And what really attracted my attention was after I started Googling the story, I could see that in every single launch shot next to Reza there was that guy, Joe Lowe, the one involved with the, with the fund with all the risking money. You know, so there's, there's Leo, there's Martin, uh, you know, and the lineup there are all the stars. And, and I just thought, well, this is a bit out in the open, isn't it? I mean, you know, so, so what I did was... Um, I asked a question. 
Uh, when, when Leo got uh, awarded uh, the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor in that film, he went up there and he thanked Joey and Reza for taking a risk on the movie. So that was enough for me to start asking questions. Uh, I asked, you know, where did they get the money from? You know, any, any, any answers? Um, and immediately, uh, as you'll find, um, it, it, you who are investigative journalists, you start getting your teeth into a story, it becomes a bit of a two-way process, especially with the joys of the internet. I started to get um, emails from people saying, hey, I, you know, I work in the Red Granite office. Red Granite was their, was their production company. I can tell you a thing or two. Um, and one of the things that I was told um, was that um, Reza had this really plush, multi-million dollar Beverly Hills home that he'd just bought and was having refurbished. So I, I decided to invest some money and I rushed over to Hollywood and I had a bit of a Hollywood adventure. Um, in fact, there was someone filming a documentary about the radio station at that time, so I even had a minder. I had a, I had a, film, um, I had a film guy come with me, and he took these photographs. We broke, in, we broke into the mansion because it was being rebuilt. And, and, and so I started to um, write about this, and, and again, just asking the questions, you know, asking, and, and, and you know, people don't, I think, do enough of this kind of journalism now. But I, 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 you know, I urge people to do it, because really, you know, to me, journalism has always been about keeping your eyes open and asking the right questions um, that are relevant. And, and this, you know, there was a whole lot of ostentatious spending going on by people who shouldn't have had that sort of money, um, you know, in this context. And, and of course, naturally, by the time I got home from that, um, from that trip, I, I, was be, I was followed by vicious legal letters <laughs> threatening, threatening me with, with death and destruction and, well, certainly financial ruin. Um, and again, um, by this time, I was off on a limb. I, I, I was doing all this, obviously, on my own, um, just, just to put it in context. I'd, I had given up my job because it helped bring up my kids. Um, so, uh, and I was taking a bit of a career break when I got stuck into this, obviously too much time on my hands. Um, and um, so therefore I didn't have the editor, I didn't have the lawyer. Um, and so therefore, you know, I, I um, uh, which, which is frightening um, and lonely, but also liberating. Um, and I decided to take my chances with these guys. Um, and somehow, so far, I'm still afloat. Um, the next story I got, I, so I, I, you know, I was intrigued by these, um, these legal attacks um, and ignored them. Um, and um, file, file them in the bin was um, a very useful piece of advice I, had, I was given by a senior guy from Shillings, actually. And um, that's what I did when he sent me one, too. Um, but <laughs> um, that's my book. He, tried, he, he, he threatened me that if I, if I published my book, um, that um, I would be sued um, and destroyed. Um, and I took his advice and filed his letter in the bin. Um, uh, but, and kept on with the story, and, 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 and I was getting a lot of open source. This, this, the, the hotel chain of carriages, um, a, a, a court case that was then uploaded, um, showed a judgment that was very detailed and gave me the proof um, that Joe Lowe had been uh, seeking to invest a billion dollars in that hotel chain, um, backed by 1MDB, according to the judge. So that was, you know, basically they'd been denying that. Joe Lowe had started denying that he had had more than a very cursory and fleeting involvement with 1MDB, helping some advice to the Prime Minister in setting it up, but, you know, that by the time this, this had happened, he wasn't involved anymore. Um, and, you, you know, again, you're testing the lies. You know, judge says you're lying. What's your answer? Silence. Okay. So, I, I, um, so by that stage, I'd become very intrigued. I was still writing about you know, Borneo issues, but I'd become very intrigued with 1MDB. We're, we're kind of halfway through uh, 2014, um, and, you know, I've always got my ear for a whistleblower, and um, my whistleblower in this was, was Xavier Justo. Um, I had heard that um, he'd been sounding out opposition folk, um, saying that he had the information 
that would help keep the opposition leader who was being driven into jail on this bogus Sonobi charge that could, that could save him jail. He just wanted a few million dollars for the information. Um, nobody was listening to him because of that. Um, but I could see from the taster information he'd been slipping out to people. Having done a lot of investigation on 1MDB, one, one my, my instincts and my knowledge of the case told me um, that this was likely to be genuine material. I really wanted to meet Xavier. Um, and it, it took me six months. I flew to Thailand four times uh, to try and persuade him that, um, you know, maybe you should just give it to me because I have no money. Um, and it was very important that we should have this story out. Um, and I, I badgered away at him, um, got to know him. We got to trust each other. Um, and um, eventually, I actually, as, as things got really, the day that um, Anwar was actually shoved in, in jail was the day that I persuaded one of the media tycoons of Malaysia to pay the $2 million that, that Xavier wanted for that information. And um, my brokerage on that deal gained me a copy of his database, um, which was of the company that he had worked with uh, for a while. Um, Petra Saudi um, International was, a, you must tell me if I'm running over time-wise. Yeah, Jump in. About 15 minutes and then five minutes to Q&A. Okay, right, well, I, um, that, that sounds perfect. <laughs> um, so so uh, Petra Saudi International was the company that had been presented as the joint venture partner for this 1MDB development fund where all the money was going. That's all we knew. We knew that it was supposed to have something to do with Saudi Arabia, but, but nothing was coming out. Um, and nobody knew where the money had gone, where it had been invested. Um, and I, I'd done a bit of um, digging into the company and realized that uh, one of the sons of the, the Saudi king uh, was a, a sort of kind of a sleeping partner and 50% shareholder of the company. Um, but you know, we really knew nothing about who these guys were, although they were rumored to be friendly with Najib's family and his sons once again. So what, what Xavier had, he'd gone and worked for them as a director of the company for a while and realized that there was something very odd about this joint venture. He'd got the database, he'd fallen out with them and left. And I, and I now had that database. And, and it basically showed what had happened. Um, it, actually, the database even had some photographs that these guys were sending to each other. It was their server, all their emails. Um, and one of those photographs really sums up what the joint venture deal was with Petra Saudi. Um, you can see in the lineup, Joe Lowe, who supposedly had nothing to do with uh, the fund. There's the Saudi prince. There's Najib. And on the other side, his sons and, and, and the other partner in the company. The first billion dollars that had been borrowed by the Malaysian Development Fund under the control of Najib, 700 million of that had gone uh, supposedly to, uh, to Petra Saudi, but actually into a company owned by Joe Lowe called Goodstar. So um, 300 million had gone to Petra Saudi and had been frittered away um, and used for Petra Saudi's affairs, um, none of it really going back to 1MDB. Um, another billion dollars was, was uh, later also ploughed in um, in the same way to buy out, you know, to, to, to pay for Joe Lowe and, and, and the guys who'd agreed to act as a front. Um, it was as simple as that, and that's why they weren't filing accounts. The money had all been stolen. Um, it was a bombshell story, um, and I broke that. I gave, the, I gave a copy of the data to Sunday Times, who very gingerly sort of, you know, they said they had more legal letters on that one story from Joe Lowe's lawyers, the Petra Saudi lawyers, the, 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 the Prince's lawyers, you know, Najib's lawyers, than practically any other story. And as a result, what would have been a great, great story they compressed into a small foreign story on, on the foreign pages. But it gave me the backup I needed as a small blog to go with this massive story, um, which created, which really began the landslide in Malaysia. And, and brought me some more of those useful emails. Another source uh, saw, saw this and came out with the next stage of where the billions had gone, which was another front that was set up with um, a sovereign wealth fund in Abu Dhabi called Abar, um, part of the now part of Mubadala. Um, and um, here is uh, uh, the, uh, the man in charge, the chairman of that fund, um, on his off day. Um, by day, he would be seen in his very, very respectable robes, being extremely religious um, leader of um, the sovereign wealth fund of Abu Dhabi. And by, by night, he was, um, he was in topless bars um, and zooming around in one of those of those 50 bespoke 
um, cars. And, and what, what that information showed me was that he'd received a half billion dollar kickback for using his fund um, as a conduit for more, yet more billions of stolen money. Um, these are the, Ameri the Malaysian um, uh, investigators. My stories on my little blog triggered enough sensation and outrage in Malaysia and gave enough you know, elbow um, grease to the, to the opposition to demand investigations. And although Najib didn't realize it, I think he thought he could control the process you know, he said this must be investigated if there's any wrongdoing. You know, naturally, those guilty must be punished. And wow, everyone's rushed in there. And um, out of those investigations, I started to get more leaks. Um, for example, how some of the money was being channeled, the main banks it was being channeled through, including BSI Bank, um, for example, UBS Bank, um, uh, Standard Chartered, um, BSI uh, it was the bank was the oldest bank in Switzerland, and it closed as a result of its of its scandalous, um, um, you know, um, complicity in, in this in this um, particular affair, um, which was uh, sad, I suppose, for, for very many people who, who worked in the bank, but but very exemplary for for all the others, Coots, J.P. Morgan. All have been fined. Uh, Falcon Bank is about to go under. It's under criminal um, investigation, as, as of course is, is now um, Goldman Sachs, who had raised the bonds that um, that had, um, you know, brought all this money into um, into One MDB. Um, Goldman Sachs raised the money. They passed it to BSI. BSI passed it to Falkland, Falcon, and Falcon sent. Um, well, uh, 680 million into the uh, bank account of the prime minister on one occasion. That's my, uh, what about, what, what happens to you when you do a story like this? Um, Xavier, my whistleblower, um, got picked up in Thailand. Malaysia and the Petra Saudi directors got together. They cooked up a story. They bought, they bought people in the Thai authorities. And um, it was 18 months before I was able to get um, Xavier out of jail. Um, and um, in the meantime, they got him to, to they forced him to make confessions, um, saying that I was a massive forger and I'd set around forging all those um, 330,000 documents and emails that were in the database he'd given me. Um, and this was, of course, all there was a massive, you know, propaganda campaign, as you can well imagine, in Malaysia. They bought, um, you know, an enormous amount of fake news um, facilities. Endless websites were st set up to attack and and destroy me, um, and, and I had to sort of keep battling through that. Um, fake news is a subject um, close to my heart we can discuss, um, and indeed, uh, you know, the ongoing legal battles, the threats. Um, the Malaysian government um, issued uh, warrants for my arrest under various um, uh, sort of crimes that they had. Um, um, uh, interfering with the due process of democracy, for example, was one. I was accused of spreading false news. They issued an Interpol red notice alert against me to try and have me extradited uh, for terrorism offenses, trying to topple a government. Um, and meanwhile, of course, they were hacking away at me like mad. I was finding I was being followed around the streets of London. Um, you know, they were trying, they were attacking my site. Of course, they banned my site um, in Malaysia. Um, so, I, you know, I, I had to sort of put quite a quite a stiff upper lip over this. Um, and um, it went on for several months. Um, but in the process, I knew that people were glued to my blog. They were finding ways to, um, to, to, to um, access it. Um, I'd, I'd passed all the information to the FBI um, and to our own authorities. I'm not that there's any use whatsoever, but the FBI were looking into it. Um, and, um, you know, I just had to battle on. Uh, more leaks. I, I discovered, uh, or I, I gained the information about that payment I mentioned of 681 million from 1MDB into the Prime Minister's accounts. Again, using my contacts within all those investigations that were going on. Um, he said that it was just a donation from a Saudi prince. I reckoned I knew who that Saudi was. <laughs> Um, and this tussle continued. The Wall Street Journal took up that, um, up that story. I gave them the information, and, and that helped, uh, again, turbocharge the impact of what I was writing in my very small blog. Um, Najib realized enough was enough. Um, eventually, in July, the end of July 2015, 
he had a coup, effectively. Um, he got rid of his attorney general, who had got too, who, who was, um, you know, who'd got too far. He got rid of his deputy, who'd been questioning him. He um, he sacked numerous officers. He closed down the investigation. And this is his new attorney general, new in the job, um, announcing that the investigation had been completed. Um, there had been numerous, um, you know, um, investigations into all the issues concerned. He said, holding up investigation papers, um, and there was no wrongdoing. He could confirm, and uh, the matter was closed. Um, a, an enterprising photographer took pictures. Of, of that, um, and, and they turned out to be genuine investigation papers. Um, and, and zooming in on them, I could see actually they proved everything I'd said about the money trails. It was terribly <laughs> satisfying. Um, and then two days later, I got this. Um, and one of the biggest risks I ever took, I think, was publishing this because it was a very, very scary moment. This was an arrest notice that that sacked Attorney General had um, had issued for the Prime Minister on the basis of those um, documents that uh, that man held up, um, and I could tell it was genuine. I took about 36 hours testing it against, you know, people who knew what, you know, what charge papers, charge sheets looked like, getting it translated, matching it up, and I decided this was genuine. The, the note that had come with it was, this is why Najib fired the Attorney General. It was a warrant for his arrest, effectively. Um, about six weeks after that, um, the prosecutor who had been engaged to draw up that document was rammed in moving traffic in central KL, uh, bringing his car to a halt. Um, a gang of people jumped out of that car behind him. They pulled him into their own car and then drove off the two cars. And he was found a few days later encased in a barrel, submerged barrel of cement. Um, and that case is still ongoing. So there were some very grim and, 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 and you know, um, tearful moments, actually. Um, I got to know his family well um, in this whole affair. But, but it was shortly after that that um, the Americans rode to my uh, rescue. They had been quietly looking into this whole scandal. And um, in July 2016, uh, it went on, as you can see, for, very, for many months, they held a snap press conference at which they brought charges, they sequestered um, eventually $1.7 billion worth of assets um, stolen, um, bought with in the United States with stolen 1MDB money. Um, and they basically spelled out over 251 pages um, how, um, uh, you know, how the money had been diverted from 1MDB into exactly the things I'd been talking about. I can't think of one thing that actually I'd, I'd, I'd got wrong on it. So it was, it was one of the sort of great moments of, vindication and total and utter relief because up to that point it had really been me against everyone on this story and now I had the FBI uh, pressing charges. Um, Najib, you know, hit back, you know, he, he clamped down, he brought in fake news laws, he intimidated the electorate, um, he, he brought in emergency legislation, anyone who said this was true, you know, and, and nobody thought that actually within Malaysia, despite the growing global investigations that were now taking place, Singapore, Switzerland, we're all after this money trail now, thanks to the US starting it. Um, nobody thought that they would be able, you know, that the people would be able to um, get him out in this fake election that we were coming up to, which he left to the very last minute um, in May last year. But what, it, what that story had done was bring everyone else together. This is uh, the old prime minister who had been the bitter enemy of uh, the guy in jail, meeting in one of his court appearances. Um, and uh, they united. Uh, an opposition coalition came together. Despite the fact my, my website was banned, everybody was finding ways of getting these stories. In fact, via WhatsApp, Facebook, throughout Malaysia. And uh, this elderly guy just took the country with him and somehow defying, you know, the forces of gravity and every single expert and pundit on the planet except me, um, the Malaysian people won that election and drove this guy out. And without a doubt, um, that story, that scandal that focused everyone's minds on what was wrong with their country played its role in achieving that totally unexpected election uh, landslide against a government that had been in control um, for, for decades. Well, so that... Wait, wait, wait.
probably stop there. Well, I was about to stop there with with one with one word, which was. I'd like to stop on a high note. Well, this is my last this is my last slide, Martin, and my last thought is to all of you uh, to bear in mind um, why it's important that journalists do what they do. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Thank you.